It's probably not surprising to you that temperature usually has a profound effect on reaction rates. In some cases, this is obvious in our daily lives. We'll notice that milk will spoil more rapidly at room temperature than it will in the refrigerator, for instance. And the spoilage of milk is just a series of biochemical uh, reactions. So, uh, we may see this, in fact, if we look at, suppose we had a first order reaction and we looked at the log of the concentration versus time, we know the slope of this graph will be the rate constant. What we'll find is that if we were to graph the log of the concentration versus time for uh, increasing temperature, we would find that if we did it at a high temperature, we'd get a very high slope, and if we did it at a low temperature, we'd have a low slope. That tells us that the rate constant itself for reaction must be a function of temperature. And that the higher the temperature, the higher the value of the rate constant, not just the rate. The relationship between the temperature and the value of the rate constant can be modeled by the Arrhenius equation. So this tells us that the rate constant is equal to some constant A times the exponential of the negative of the activation energy divided by RT, where R is the usual gas constant, 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin, and temperature, of course, is the temperature in Kelvin. So let's look at the rationale behind the rate constant, and then we'll do an example where we use this, we use the Arrhenius equation to, to model the temperature dependence of the rate constant. So we can see that this pre-exponential factor A is going to have the same units as K. So for first order, it would be 1 over time. For zeroth order, it would be molarity per second. For a second order, it would be reciprocal molarity, reciprocal seconds, etc. So it's going to have the same units as K because this is an exponential, so it has to be unitless. Activation energy is going to be in units of energy, and typically we're going to express our activation energy in kilojoules per mole. Typical activation energies tend to be uh, in the tens or sometimes hundreds of kilojoules per mole. So let's look at the rationale behind these, behind these two terms, where they could come from theoretically. Imagine that we have a sample of molecules that are going to react, in this case a blue molecule and a red molecule, and they're going to crash into each other because molecules are always in motion. And we can imagine that in a chemical reaction, we're going to have to break some bonds in one of the reactant and the other reactant, and then we're going to make new bonds between these to form our product. We're breaking the bonds in the first step of that reaction is going to cost energy. We can visualize that with what we call a reaction coordinate diagram. So this is the reaction coordinate, which just means that we have reactants on the left hand side we have products over here and as we move in this direction we're going from products towards reactants and we're going to have a energy axis here and we might imagine that we start off with some reactants and we're going to form products and they're going to be lower in energy but we don't go straight downhill we have to first break some bonds in our reactants before we can make bonds in our products and we know breaking bonds costs energy so if we were to look at this whole diagram, so if we were to look at this whole diagram, we have to go uphill first, and then we get our, our benefit of, of making our products down here. And so there's a cost we have to get, we have to pay before we can get the benefit. And so this energy cost here, we'll draw a little diagram here. This energy difference that we have to put in before we can go downhill in energy to our products, we're going to call the activation energy. So this is the difference in energy between where we started and this top space up here, which is sort of halfway between reactants and products. And this might be a species where we've got some half-broken bonds and some half-made bonds, so it's, it's, it's not very stable. So we're going to give it the name the transition state. So TS, TS stands for transition state. So the transition state is unstable, but sometimes symbolized with this little double dagger 
which just means that we're talking about the property of the transition state. It's an unstable species, and you can see it doesn't have an existence that is uh, stable. If we're at the transition state up here, we could imagine decaying back downhill towards our reactants or going forward to products, but we can't stay here. It's like a ball bearing at the very, very top of a hill. It's going to roll down one way or the other. So we can't isolate the transition state. It's not you can't find it in a bottle or something like that. Okay, so we have to pay this energy cost. Now, if we imagine looking at these molecules crashing into each other, that collision can supply this energy to go uphill to the transition state. But the more energy we have, the more likely we're going to be to be able to get enough energy to go to the top of this to the transition state. And we know that the thermal energy of molecules is proportional to the temperature. So let's look at the Arrhenius equation one more time. It says that K is equal to A E to the minus E A over R T. So we can see the bigger this energy penalty is, that's going to make this exponential smaller, and that's going to make our rate constant smaller. So the higher this energy hill is that we have to go over, the smaller K is going to be. On the other hand, if we make the temperature bigger, that's going to make this fraction smaller, which is going to make this exponential bigger, which means our rate constant will be bigger. If we have a higher temperature, these molecules will be crashing together violently enough that they have enough energy to get up to this transition state. So there's this balance between the energy cost to get to the transition state and the thermal energy available that determines how big this term is. So that explains this part of the Uranus equation. Well, what about this thing? What about this pre-exponential factor A? To explain the effect of this pre-exponential factor or, or why we ha even have it, we have to remember that not all chemical reactions are simple spheres banging into each other. Molecules, after all, often have a complicated structure. And we can model that structure by taking a dry erase pen and its cap, or any kind of pen and cap really, and imagine that as a chemical reaction where these things are bouncing around and we want them to react to form the capped pen. So we can imagine them banging into each other in this orientation. So we can imagine them bang into each other in this orientation. And we know that if we, if we push them together hard enough, they're going to react and we're going to form a capped pen. But imagine that we had them in a different orientation. So imagine they're, they're, they're flying through the reaction mixture. And they're moving in this direction. But they're oriented in this, in this other way. Well, the reactive ends of the molecule so to speak, are here and here. So when they crash into each other, there's no way we can get a capped pen out of this regardless of how fast these are moving. So there's something beyond the temperature and the activation energy, and those factors are put into the A factor, okay, because they're not temperature dependent, okay? So uh, for complex molecules where this has to be oriented a certain way, so the pen tip would have to be over here and the pen cap would have to be oriented this way, uh, we tend to have small values for A, and for reactions where we have spherical molecules where orientation doesn't matter, we tend to have larger values of the pre-exponential factor A.